Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's delightful to be with you this morning as we share this recorded service together. I hope that you are well and that you've had a good week. And now we have an opportunity to take some time aside to worship God. I'm going to read some words to begin with from Deuteronomy, from the Old Testament, chapter 32 and verses 1 to 4. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words that I say. Let my teaching fall on you like rain. Let my speech settle like dew. Let my words fall like rain on tender grass, like gentle showers on young plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. And then from the 99th Psalm and verses 1 to 5. The Lord is king. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice, with righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. We're going to hear now the words of the song, The Splendor of the King. How great is our God. The Splendor of the King Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. 
with me how great is our God And all will see how great, how great is our God Will you join with me as we pray and give thanks to God for his greatness. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, holy one, mighty king, we worship you. We cannot even begin to Imagine, envisage your splendor. We thank you that it gives us real comfort to know that you are other. You are eternal. You are perfect. You are just and fair righteous and good, sovereign and merciful, full of grace and tender compassion. O oh Lord, we thank you that this is our God. You are the one that we worship. So we exalt your name this morning. We give you thanks and praise. You have done good things for us, Lord, even in lives where perhaps very often there are difficult things, unanswered prayers, uncertainties about the future. We thank you that even in the midst of this, we can have that assurance that you are God are a rock and we can trust you even when we can trust no one else. We thank you for your love as it has been revealed to us in Jesus, a love that loves us even though we are unworthy, a love that allows your son to die on our behalf that we might be set free forgiven, acceptable, and welcomed into your kingdom. So help us to look to you afresh at this time, even as we listen to this recording, and in the day and the week that lies ahead. We worship you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Love through the storm. 
Lord. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on Now we have a reading from, again, the book of Deuteronomy, and this time chapter 10 and verses 12 to 22. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. Yet the Lord chose your ancestors as the objects of his love. And he chose you, their descendants, above all other nations, as is evident today. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you, too, must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. 
You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you've seen with your own eyes. When your ancestors went down into Egypt, there were only 70 of them. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. An elderly woman who was leaving at the end of a worship service was greeted by the pastor at the door as she left. Oh, pastor, she said, you don't know how much your sermons have meant to my husband since he lost his mind. Well, that's a, a veiled compliment, if ever there was one. It, is that, I wonder, the relevance with which people see the church sometimes? Yet God calls us, as his people, to be a prophetic community. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be a prophetic community? If you were watching last week, you will have seen that we looked at a verse from the small book towards the back of the Old Testament, the book of Micah, where God says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And there are so many echoes of that in the passage that we've just read from the book of Deuteronomy. To act justly. This command requires us to assume a sense of responsibility to others and for others. It insists on the right of others. And it's notable that it's a requirement to act, not just to theorize about it. To act justly and to love mercy. Mercy goes beyond justice and is close to grace. And we have to love mercy, God says. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Without mercy, we would have no hope, not only in this life, but in the one to come. Micah tells us to love mercy. He isn't just saying demonstrate mercy or discipline yourself to be merciful. He wants us to fall in love with it, to lose ourselves in the beauty of mercy. And to walk humbly with your God, it all comes from there. Otherwise, it will be all from the wrong spirit and with a bad attitude. The combination of these three things, acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God, can only be achieved by the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. So I wonder... If we were to use this verse from Micah to diagnose the presence or absence of Christianity in our lives as assessed by those who know us, by our family, by our peers, what would be the likely verdict? What would be the likely outcome? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's what a prophetic community is looks like. It means being such that we are by nature challenging accepted concepts of power, wealth, status, and security. That's what Jesus did. Indeed, he was the very embodiment of this. It means that we make the reign and righteousness of God our number one priority. We've seen it in the passages I've read already today. But God said of himself, for I, the Lord, love justice. The Bible tells us that we are created in God's image. So a strong sense of justice should be rooted in our very DNA. There are many times in my life where I've had that deep feeling inside of, it's not fair. When things happen to me, 
or have happened to me. I've sometimes thought, particularly when I'm younger, it's not fair. And now I see it in my two young children. Quite often if uh, myself or my wife decides something that the children don't like, or if it seems to them as if we're being biased to one or the other, they will say, it's not fair. But this can so easily be only focused on a sense of injustice for yourself. God says, do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites. Love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here we have justice. We have love. We have compassion. And we have equality. It's sadly all too prevalent in many cultures to be hostile to strangers. So this is a radical statement from God. The British government's Go Home campaign of 2015 was the, ki the kind of emphasis on the importance of national identity, uh, like so-called British values, that actually results in excluding the other. Injustice should provoke us to a response because we worship a God of justice who's always close to the brokenhearted. He has a passionate heart for justice. He says, defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain or uphold the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Now, I'm not suggesting the British government was wicked or is wicked, but the gospel announces God's eternal no to injustice and oppression. There's Mary's joyful and prophetic song at the news of her choice to be the mother of God's saviour. And it's all about God's passion to cast down the mighty from their thrones and to lift up the lowly, to fill the hungry with good things and to send the rich away empty. So surely that means that the call of God's people as Christ's body on this earth is to fight against injustice and to love, champion and protect those people that face unjust hostility in their everyday lives. We're called to give ourselves to that which moves the heart of God, whose passionate heart is for the brokenhearted. Sadly, this is not often the case. Back in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets from about seven or 800 years before the birth of Jesus was a man called Amos. And God spoke through him about what he thought of the religious people back then. In chapter five, we read that he says, you twist justice, making it a bitter pill for the oppressed. He says, you trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. And he says, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and sacred assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and endless righteous living. Amos paints a vivid picture. He speaks about a man strolling through a forest. Suddenly he sees a lion and he bolts from it. In terror, he dashes round the corner, only to run headlong into a grizzly bear. 
panic-stricken, he flees from the bear's grasps. And now he's being chased by two predators and he seeks security in his log cabin. Panting with exhaustion, he leans on the wall to recover his breath. Only for a rattlesnake hiding in the timber to rear its head and bite him. Amos is making the very vivid point that we need to take seriously that though God is a God of love, he's also a God of justice and righteousness. You see, people sang hymns. They said prayers. They regarded this as worship. But as far as Amos was concerned, their sanctuaries were doomed. Yes, their altars were well subscribed. Their services were probably pretty colorful and theatrical and entertaining. But they never demanded moral change in anybody. People thought that you could seek God without simultaneously seeking goodness. There was something about these Israelites that made their religious devotions utterly obnoxious to the God they were supposed to be worshipping. What was the use of fervent worship if the people failed to roll out justice and righteousness in the irrigation channels of daily life and relationships? Otherwise, it's just religion in a box, a sealed compartment with no communicating exit to the rest of life. Worship without the recognition of and dependence on God's grace that results in changed hearts and devoted lives. In his inaugural hometown sermon, Jesus preached from the prophet Isaiah. And he preached the passage that says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free. He's quoting directly from Isaiah and he's applying it to himself and the reason why he's come. So the gospel that Jesus came preaching was in fact inseparable from concerns about social justice, from care for all those who find themselves oppressed by society's laws and institutions, however subtly. Society might do well to heed the warning. But what's scary in what Amos says is that this message is for God's chosen people. Later, the religious leaders in Jesus' day were outwardly focused quick to point out others' weaknesses, focusing on punishment, not on mercy, elevating approval over acceptance, with a low tolerance for errors, blind to their own spiritual condition. So unwilling to admit their own sin, they promoted exclusion, not inclusion, and they used the excuse of purity. By contrast, biblical truth requires us to be a prophetic community where we truly embrace the other. I know that's literally difficult right now, but the spirit of it is that we do that. As I mentioned last week, this month of October each year is designated Black History Month. Issues of injustice impact many different categories of people. So what we've been thinking about today is, is wide ranging when we think about justice. But the tragic event in Minneapolis, USA back in May this year has particularly highlighted the issue of racial injustice. It's resulted in the prominence of the Black Lives Movement. And in many ways, perhaps this movement exposes the failure of the church to live out the gospel. And it offers a prophetic voice that calls the church to a renewed sense of this calling to follow in Jesus' footsteps. The movement is potentially a gift to the church 
in that it's an unwitting prophet calling the church to repent and change. As one writer has said, Black Lives Matter cries out from the wilderness exposing the church's false gospel that has severed the proclamation of the coming kingdom of God from its just politics. And despite the heightened awareness at this time, it's not at all clear that in America that the white evangelical church is concerned about black lives, much less willing to own its own complicity in supporting policies and systems in government and, in, and, and of greatest concern in local churches. Well, things may not be as bad in the UK, but there's still a long way to go even in the church. Going back 55 or more years ago, Martin Luther King said, honesty impels us to admit that the church has not been true to its social mission on the question of social justice. In this area, it has failed Christ miserably. This failure is due not only to the fact that the church has been appallingly silent and disastrously indifferent to the realm of race relations, but even more to the fact that it has often been an active participant in shaping and crystallizing the patterns of the race-caste system. I wonder whether you remember this man, Ben Lindsay. He's been uh, as a visitor to Crofton Park a few times. And in the very near future, I plan to read this book. It's called We Need to Talk About Race that Ben Lindsay's written. It's about the black experience in white majority churches. I'm going to read it. And I want you to encourage you to read it as well. I can, if you, you can probably get one relatively easily, uh, particularly if you're, if you're online, uh, but I can help you to get a copy if you would like one. Because although here at Crofton Park Baptist Church we're no longer a white majority church, that doesn't automatically mean that everything is fine here. You see, I believe God calls us to sincerity in this. That may involve the willingness to listen to others with all our heart, mind, and soul, what we might call a deep listening. And also the openness to enter into another's world, to travel, as it were, with other people so that we understand one another better, and as a consequence, we act in the best interests of the other. Sincerity means a willingness to be vulnerable, and that's a scary thing. It's too easy just to put a good face on it and to stuff down our real feelings. Sincerity in this means seeking to be able to express how we feel honestly, being willing to share true thoughts and attitudes, dreams and goals, reactions and feelings. It involves listening to others and seeking to learn and understand from their perspective. For some, it may involve invoking feelings of, of, of guilt and fear. There might be a need to share past hurts. You might get hurt in sharing. But the only way to ensure never to get hurt is just to keep barriers up. But then there's no growth. There's no depth, there's no journey towards healing. For 20 years or more, I've been an active supporter of an organization called Novi Most. It means New Bridge in Bosnia. As a result of that, I've, I've been to visit Bosnia on four occasions. And that organization is being prophetic in that it's bringing young people from different ethnic groups together that are deeply suspicious of each other. And in doing so, it's declaring something of the nature of the kingdom of God. 
and it involves aiming for a journey towards entering each other's world in a way that makes the good news of the reconciling gospel of Jesus Christ real and relevant and transforming. The Apostle Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors, as if God was making his appeal through us. More than anything else, people need to see that the Christian faith is authentic. The 21st century mind is clogged with misinformation about the church. The church is meant to be a community of people transformed by the gospel, whose purpose is no less than to transform the rest of society, faithfully proclaiming that same gospel, the gospel that announces the end of oppression. So, our vocation and mission should be to give the world a glimpse of the just community that Christ makes possible through the church. I want to lead us now in a prayer. In this prayer, as we go through it, there are some words in bolder type. Um, and wherever you are, if you feel you can own those words, please do join in with those words as we pray together. Let's pray. Loving and forgiving God, we come to you today recognizing that in matters of ethnicity, we have no choice. We are who we have been made to be. Before you, we rejoice at our diversity and our hearts lift at your great vision of a worshiping multitude gathered from every nation, tribe, people, and language. But nonetheless, we recognize that our present reality is very far from this ideal. Each of us has been shaped by different forces. Some of us have been ground down while others have been built up. Some of us have been worn away or have become fractured or broken. Some of us have found life a burden rather than a joy. None of us have experienced the perfect life. Some of us have inherited power whilst others have inherited powerlessness. Some of us have been born white in a world where whiteness confers privilege. Others of us have been born black in a world where darker skin carries disadvantage. We know that this is not the world as you would have it to be, but is our world and it's been our experience. None of us asked for our skin color. None of us asked to be born heirs of oppression. None of us asked to inherit power or powerlessness. So before you and in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves all people equally, regardless of ethnicity, gender or social status, we come now to recommit ourselves to your vision of the world. We come now to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and to offer ourselves once to live out your coming kingdom of equality and justice in our lives, in our churches and in our communities. And so we confess our own complicity in the status quo, which divides and distorts humanity. As we pray, we ask that you will release us from guilt and will help us to find ways of laying down the burdens we have inherited. Help us to discover our true and rightful place within the new humanity created in Christ Jesus. All races together, we confess that we have sinned and that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We confess our failures to speak out against injustice. 
We confess those times when as individuals and as churches, we've witnessed the fracturing of humanity along ethnic grounds and yet have remained silent. We confess those times when we have been the powerful ones and have chosen to withhold that power whilst another human suffered. We confess the sin of racist exclusion, the abuse of power to oppress and demean. May those of us who have experienced ourselves exclusion be the first to speak up for others. May we create spaces for reconciliation. We pray for our churches. May they become places of reconciliation where each human soul is valued and where equality in Christ is a reality in our midst. Forgive us those times where we do not live out our calling as your people. May our churches model the new humanity of Christ to those in the communities where we live. We pray for our communities. Where there's division, may we bring restoration. Where there is inequality, may we bring justice. Where there is powerlessness, may we lift up the brokenhearted. Where there is damage, may we bring healing. Loving and forgiving God, hear our confession. Hear the desire of our hearts to be different. Grant us your forgiveness and remake us according to the likeness of Christ. Amen. All this is possible because of the greatness of the God whom we worship. And so we sing together, praise him, you heavens, great in power. Praise him, you heavens, and all that's above. Praise him, you angels, and heavenly hosts.
this week, our prayers of intercession are going to be led by Maudlin. Good morning and welcome to our time of intercessory prayer as we continue this morning's worship. We will be looking at COVID-19, the world's need and our fellowship in our intercessory prayer today. So let us still our hearts and our mind before God as we offer our prayer to you. Father God, we acknowledge you as our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of need. Lord, the world is still at war with this virus. It's nearly a year since it first came to light, and we are none the wiser on how to combat this disease. Lord, as we head into the direction of another lockdown, show us, Lord. Reveal to us as individuals, collectively as your bride, and to world leaders and scientists, what you have to say to us concerning COVID-19. What is it that you require of us, Lord, at a time such as this? Speak to your creation again. Spirit of God, we pray, open our hearts to hear, our eyes to see, our mouths to declare, and our hearts to accept what you are saying to us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the world. Father God, as your creation continue to grow as in childbirth, we continue to look to you for the needs of the world. We pray for those in need of food, water, and a place to call upon, the displaced and vulnerable in society. God of justice, we cry out to you again for our world leaders. Give them your spirit of justice and wisdom as they govern. May they lead by example, by creating a fair and united society. A society that does not look out only for its own good, but for the good of all mankind. Father, we pray for peace, peace between you and all mankind. Peace with ourselves and peace with each other. Father, we thank you for the work of the cross, for bridging the gap between us and you, and making it possible to be at peace with ourselves and each other. Father, for such a time as this, pour out your spirit on all mankind and give us your peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for our church. Father, we bring before you the needs of our fellowship. Father, as we continue to worship you in this difficult time, we pray for your continued guidance. We pray that as a fellowship we will continue to seek you in our daily lives, that we will not allow the difficulties of this time to get in the way of our focus on you, but to use this time to earnestly seek you and your ways. We pray that the current situation with COVID-19 will not stir up a sense of fear, but that we will continue to look to you in confidence and quiet trust. Lord, we would remember those of our fellowship that are sick and pray for a healing touch from you. Surround them with your love and presence each day. We pray for those who are seeking work and those whose jobs are at risk. We pray, Jehovah Jireh, that you would make a way where there seemed to be no way. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. God of comfort and peace, draw near. We pray for those who are lonely, those who live on their own with the thought of another lockdown bringing anxiety and fear. Lord of all, draw near, 
May we all know the assurance of your presence with us now and in the days to come. Lord, we have already acknowledged in our service today the importance of repentance and forgiveness. We have repented and seek your forgiveness for the part we have played in injustices as your people, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Lord, we know that it is equally important to repent of any bitterness or malice that we may hold on to as a result of being treated unfairly. With this in mind, Lord, we repent of any bitterness, malice or unforgiveness against our brothers and sisters in Christ and those of society that have just judged us or wronged us due to our kind. We choose this day, Lord God, to forgive, recognising that to hold on to bitterness, malice and unforgiveness is equally damaging to us as is the act of injustice towards us. And as our Lord Jesus commanded us to forgive, so we repent and ask for your forgiveness. Father, in a time such as this, bind us together now in your love with cords that cannot be broken. Loving Heavenly Father, hear the prayers we offer you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Maudlin. Each week we have a mission prayer slot where we focus on the needs of uh, people or organizations in mission locally or further afield in the world. Today we're more in a sense at home as we focus on the young people in our church and community and Judith is going to lead that now. Good morning. Our mission prayer this week is for home mission and the mission at home we're looking at is our youth work and obviously that's uh, been a bit challenging and difficult to do during the pandemic but the children still exist and we want to pray for you all so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being father to us all we can learn so much about being a good parent from the patience, grace and love you shower upon us. We thank you for the young people connected to our church. Thank you too for those who come to Youth Club when it could open. Please reassure them all of your love when they may be feeling lonely and isolated. Please protect them from danger and bad influences. May they remember that you value them and want them to come to know and love you. We pray particularly for those who are tempted to give up on following you. Please call them back and keep us praying for them and loving them. We thank you for organisations like XLP in London and Scripture Union nationwide. Bless their visits into schools and the interaction they have with all young people and especially those who may be in danger of dropping out or getting into trouble. Thank you, Lord, that they are motivated by your love and care for each individual. May these Christians have a great impact as they guide them safely. We pray for all who suffered with the exam uncertainty and disruption over the last two terms. Please give them a keenness to study this term, despite the options for more tight lockdowns. May they have peace knowing that all things do work together for the good of those who love you. For those settling into a new school, may they keep their sense of enthusiasm, be able to make friends and understand their lessons and learn well. As half term comes, Lord, and we have to resist mixing, please guide them and show them how to relax safely. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, Amen. Thanks, Judith. And now over to Clement, who's going to share some news and information. 
Good morning. Here are our announcements for this week. Um, this will be the last uh, pre-recorded session we'll be having for uh, the foreseeable. Hopefully the pandemic will all be over in a few months time and we can return to normal services. But in the interim, we're going to be broadcasting live on Sunday or we'll be recording the Sunday service to be um, published on our YouTube channel later on in the day. We won't be able to broadcast to both channels simultaneously, I'm afraid. So if you currently use Facebook to watch the service, we'll be posting a link on our Facebook page on the Sunday so you can click on that and that will take you to our YouTube page where you can watch the service live. As I mentioned last week, we will be having a quiz on the 14th of November uh, in aid of Tier Fund. So that will be the big quiz night. So if you haven't signed up for that, there is a link in the newsletter and on our Facebook page. So it's an Eventbrite link, which you can click on to sign up for that. And also at the same time, if you wish to, you can donate to Tier Fund through the link that's on there. Although the Harvest Service was a couple of weeks ago, you can still make online donations to Tier Fund and Lucas through, the, through their websites. Please don't forget that next week, not this week, it is the fall back. So the clocks go back uh, by an hour next week so don't forget to uh, do that next week unless you have all these fancy new devices apart from the microwave and oven that do that for you if you do have any other news and announcements that you would like us to share during the service then please email uh, newsletter at croftonpark.org.uk thank you clement a few weeks ago at the church um, we actually made a presentation to clement um, just as really to say thank you for enabling these recorded services to happen all this time during lockdown. Um, and I'd like to show you that clip now. Take the opportunity to um, say a big thank you to Clement. Um, over the past six months, as you know, we've been having um, our services recorded. First, we tried to live stream them for a few weeks, but we were having a lot of problems with the connectivity. And since then we've been recording them uh, initially on Saturdays and then more recently on Thursdays um, so you don't get it very fresh it's usually 72 hours late by the time from when it's been recorded to when you see it at least um, but it's if we hadn't had Clement we would have been really struggling he's given so much over this last six months so much of his time and energy and effort and above all his expertise um, which has been truly amazing to produce uh, our online service every week. An awful lot of work um, and time has gone into it. I know that in a sacrificial way. And he's continuing to produce a, an online service which we're recording on Thursdays, even now for people that uh, feel they can't come out at this time. So um, as a token of our appreciation, uh, we can't sort of do this in the normal ways, in a socially distanced way. <laughs> I'm good to come up into the way. And so I want to just give you um, these gifts, Clement. Um, this, if you please know, is coffee related. Um, and there's that as well. And um, Rosemary, if you'd like to just come to the front, just wanted to also say thank you uh, to you. Yeah, I just want to also say thank you to you for releasing Clement to allow him to do and continue to do all this on our behalf. So really want to say how much we appreciate um, all that you've done for us and all that you've done for us. So can we express that again? Thank you. Yeah, just want to say that uh, thank, thank you. Um, I graciously accept these gifts. But, um, I believe that these gifts are given to me by God and uh, they're for his service. So, but thank you for the coffee related gifts as well. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, indeed, we really are grateful to Clement. As we come to the end of our time, we're going to close in prayer if you would like to join with me. Father, thank you for the things that you have placed on our heart today. 
for the way in which you have spoken to us. And we ask that each one of us might be living witnesses to the transforming reality of Jesus Christ as we seek to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. Grant us the grace to do this. Sustain us through your, your power and help us as we look to live for you in this coming week. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks so much for watching and look, we look forward to sharing with you again in the near future. Thank you.